much. Good afternoon, everyone. Cool. Awesome. Can everyone hear me? Good. I have a, I have a typically very loud voice, so microphones and me, uh, I usually hurt them. So who am I? Uh, my name is Mason. I'm a senior software engineer at Verbo, uh, part of Expedia Group on the cloud platform team. I am a volunteer educator through Teals. It's a Microsoft program to teaching computer science in public high schools. If this interests you, see me afterwards. And I'm also a documentation fanatic. Um, so first, first things first, who is this talk for? This talk is for uh, open source maintainers, developers of any level, program managers, community managers, DevOps engineers, really and truly, this, uh, this talk is for anyone who writes, maintains, or manages a product that they would intend to share with someone else. Unless this is your personal project you're gonna bury in your, you know, on a hard drive or a thumb drive in the back of your closet, you, this talk is probably for you. So act one, the conflict arises. How we manage our documentation as developers. A common approach to documentation that uh, a lot of developers and a lot of people at companies take is a developer will write some code, the developer commits code, the code goes through some reviews or testing, either automated or non-automated. Uh, we ask ourselves, is it time to release this code? Yes or no. If it's no, the developer rejoices, they get to go back to doing what they really like, it's called writing code, because every other part of this process the developer really doesn't care for that much. And if the answer is yes, someone has to write some docs. <laughs> Developers scream internally, and at some point, this someone could be the developer themselves. It could be a technical writer. It could be a different developer, a new hire or an intern that is stuck writing the docs. Um, if you want the worst product docs on earth, give them to your intern. I guarantee you, <laughs> it's, it's a great thing to do. Um, but the problem is, is that this, this approach is really not that great. Um, documentation at this point is almost an afterthought. Like we write, we spend all this time writing these products and then we ship them off. Um, long release cycles can lead to things being forgotten. I know that everybody likes to subscribe to the Agile methodology, and I also know that probably nobody on earth actually does the Agile methodology. I've never seen a single functioning company that has a true to God sprint that is real. Um, uh, you all, most people practice Agile fall, which is where we just waterfall enough to call it Agile. Um, so uh, I worked, my first job, I worked at a company where we actually shipped physical appliances. So there was no two week developments because I can't send out a f new physical box every eight, two weeks. We had eight month development cycles. So if you ask me what I wrote on the first two weeks of my development cycle, at the end of the cycle, I'm like, I, don't need, I wrote that code. And then I look at get blame and I'm like, oh crap, I wrote that code. <laughs> so yeah. Um, the more layers of separation you have between the implementer and the author, uh, the more likely you're gonna have for inaccurate or just in unusable docs. Um, the other thing is that this approach really focuses on the developer dislikes document, documenting their code, and that's actually the main core problem that we have right now, is that developers don't like documenting our code. So we have to ask ourselves, why do developers not like documenting our code? We all like writing code, and we all like talking about our code, otherwise none of us would be at this conference. Um, so why do developers hate writing about their code? The real issue here is that most developers don't dislike writing documentation. What they dislike is the workflow that their teams or their company has in place around writing documentation. Um, a developer has to switch tools when they want to document something. I'm writing code in my favorite text editor and now I have to context switch out of this and go to this wiki that has the search functionality of dev null or dev you random. Um, I have a specific product in mind that I won't say in a public conversation but catch me outside and I'll tell you exactly which company <laughs> I'm thinking of. Um, the context switch makes everybody really reluctant to write the docs, and so the task gets put off to the very end. We just, we don't want to do it, so we, we keep procrastinating. It's like your college research paper. You just keep pushing it off. Um, so how do we integrate our documentation process into a workflow that developers will actually enjoy? Well, what if we treat our documentation like code? What if instead of having our docs external to our code, the documentation lives right next to the code in the same repository? What if we use a markup language that every developer knows how to write and actually enjoys rather than make them use some WYSIWYG that was crafted by, you know, black magic and hatred, <laughs> as most of them are. Um, so what do we mean when we say treat the docs like code? It means our doc source files are stored in a version control system. This allows us to have version docs. How many people have versioned wiki pages? Good for you. You're, you, you're a hero. Most people don't. Most people don't version their stuff. Um, the docs are built automatically whenever a release happens. You know, we, we push through things through our CI/CD pipelines. We have all of this great technology. Let's apply them to the documentation. 
we ensure that a trusted set of reviewers can meticulously review the docs. And docs are tested. This is a thing that nobody ever talks about. Docs are tested for both accuracy and functionality. Because if your docs give me the wrong thing, I sit at a, at a readme thinking I'm the stupidest person on earth because it's not working when in reality you have a mistake. And if you have a hyperlink that's supposed to go somewhere that doesn't go somewhere, well, your docs are functionally broken because they no longer flow and function the way that they're supposed to. Also, we can publish the artifacts without much human intervention whatsoever. Like, these should be an automated release process. We have automated processes for our uh, software. We should have automated process for our documentation. So what do we gain from this? This promotes collaboration. Whenever the code is right next to it, we already collaborate writing code. When the docs are right next to the code, we collaborate in the docs just like we collaborate on the code. It allows us to track our documentation mistakes as bugs. This is a big one. A mistake in your documentation is a bug in your software. The, the, one of the oh, uh, mentalities that I kind of prescribe to is the OpenBSD mentality where it's a group of really amazing Canadians that write very secure operating systems that only they use. Um, and uh, I love it. It's a great OS. If you've never played with it, you can do amazing things with it. But they treat bugs in their code base as nothing less than a critical or P2 bug. Because if the code, if the docs are, or sorry, they treat bu bugs in their docs in their code base. Because if your if your docs are wrong, you can't say RTFM, which is what every developer likes to do. So you have to have good docs. Um, it allows you to include docs in your code review. Your docs should be getting updated every time you do a you do a push, and you should be doing a code review on your pushes. Hopefully, hopefully we're not just merging into master and praying production doesn't come down. Um, <laughs> that's what uh, we that's what we call YOLO development. Um, or as one of my, as one of my architects says, that's a resume generating event. Um, <laughs> so we have to include our docs in our review and it allows us to make beautiful docs. You know, we don't, we're developers, not all of us are artistically inclined. Not all of us want to spend all of our time making our docs look amazing. Well, we can write a template with code to do this for us. We're really good at making robots do things for us. We should continue to do that. And it allows us to le leverage developer tools and workflows. We have spent so much time investing in the workflows and tools that us as developers use to make good code. These workflows don't just apply to code, they can apply to almost everything. So we take those workflows and we add them to documentation and we get a lot out of it. And most importantly, this empowers your developers to document. They now have the, the documentation right next to the source code. They don't even have to leave them. They can just go over to it. It's great, they love it. So a case study, uh, a new, product team was formed at HomeAway, which is the uh, HomeAway, Verbo, Expedia, we all have different names, but we're all the same place now, um, where we had a brand new team. And the first, or it was a new GitHub organization, uh, new team members and everything, I was added to this team. The first repository that was added to the, to the organization was the documentation repository. The docs in this, in this org were the most up-to-date, and every retrospective started by, the retrospective was us reading the new parts of the documentation after every sprint. Because, and they were constantly up to date. They were versioned. People knew exactly where to go. I had to answer zero support questions because our docs were so well written that they just went to them and found them. So I've seen this work. I've implemented workflows similar to what I'm going to show you at the end of the presentation in every company that I've ever worked at, and it always greatly improves your process. So how does this change the workflow? Well, now the developer writes code in docs. The developer commits these code in the docs. We review them, and we test them with automated processes that we currently have. We say, is it time to release? If it's no, hooray, we write more code. If it is, the artifacts are published and there's no human intervention on this green section on the slide. We no longer have to do any of that because the docs just go out with the code. So act two, a hero emerges. I wrote this talk around the time that uh, Infinity War was coming out. So I was really excited for it and I haven't changed it yet. So CICD for uh, documentation. So real quick, what is CI-CD? Continuous integration, CI, means that your code is continuously tested and integrated with other code changes and merge. And continuous deployment means that code is continuously deployed with each patch to the entire code base. These come directly from a, a build docs like code book, which I'll go over in a little bit. So what does it mean for docs? It means we build a full artifact of the docs with each patch to the code, each minor version, major version, patch version. We build a brand new version of the docs and we publish them. We continuously test the content with each patch we automatically publish them with every release, and we version our docs. You have to version your documentation. It's a big thing, because if you get mismatched versions, you'll try to use features that aren't there. Imagine if you were reading nothing but Python 3 docs and you had to work on Python 2.7. You'd never get anything done. So 
uh, some common types of documentation that you'll see. You'll see long form documentations, user guides, getting started things, FAQs, etc. There are functional documentation, which is REST APIs, SDKs, man pages, and such. Most people who are writing Python code already kind of have these docs inside of it because these are inline doc strings inside of your functions and your methods. So most of you are probably have already used some of these tools before. Sphinx is a big one. Um, yeah, that was the only thing on that slide. I forgot there was it. So documentation tools. Tools. We have static site generators, which are good for our long form documentation, FAQs, run books, stuff like that. Uh, source code based documentation generators, uh, Sphinx, Javadoc, PyDoc, things like that. Some even generate clients for testing, such as Swagger and some of the more advanced ones. Um, system documentation generators, this one's included because I like it. Um, markdown there's a markdown based man page generator that I found called RON, and the old format for, uh, or the format for markdown pages is ROF, and it's RON, the opposite of ROF, and it's hilarious. I think it's a great joke. So it got, it got, it got special space in the, in the presentation. Um, one of the things you do have to be slightly weary of or you have to know is that the more powerful your documentation tool is, the more complex it is to use. Tools like MakeDocs and Microsoft Word aren't terribly complicated. Swagger itself, kind of their LaTeX, uh, you either know it or you don't. There's no in-between with LaTeX. <laughs> and Sphinx, I believe, is moderately sentient. Um, and it might, be those, it might be the world's first Turing complete documentation system. Um, it's amazing and it's really powerful, but even after four years of using it, it still gets me every other day. So I love it, nothing against Sphinx, but whenever I saw this, this graph, I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's Sphinx. So make docs. Make docs is a markdown based documentation. Wow, that's a terrible sentence. It's, a more, it's, a, it's markdown based, it has YAML based config files. Uh, the time to hello world on a make doc site is about 30 seconds. It's super simple and this is what the demo is going to cover. Um, it is easy to configure. There are many extensions and themes supported. It's completely Python based. So not only is it easy to extend and modify, but it's also, it also uses Jinja templating. So it's really nice for, you know, you can make your own templates, you can add your own themes, all of that. Um, one of the cool features about it that I love is that I can make UML diagrams in Markdown and then use a JavaScript plugin that renders them. Because how often do you make a diagram and you put it in your favorite wiki or someone makes it in like Google Google whatever or some Photoshop and they, they upload the PNG but they don't upload the source. Now the architecture has changed. Well, who has that file? I don't know. I guess we have to remake the whole documentation now because we lost, lost the image. I hate that. I've done that too many times. Um, so I started looking for ways of doing it. So there's really cool JavaScript packages that allow you to create flowcharts and sequence diagrams in very readable markdown and then they automatically generate into these. It's one of my favorite features of MakeDocs. Sphinx has something similar, but this one is super easy to use. Um, the other documentation tool we're gonna talk about is Sphinx. It is a restructured text-based documentation tool that does now have support for Markdown. Um, it's the most common tool for creating SDK documentation for ENCODE documentation in Python. So if you've made Python API docs, you've probably used Sphinx before. Um, I've never actually met anybody that uses pure just doc string and uses the actual docs tools in Python. They're actually kind of cool and I'm thinking about giving a talk on it, but Sphinx is what most people use. Um, it can literally uh, format to any that media that you can ever think, including LaTeX, which is why I think that it's sentient, because if Sphinx can write LaTeX and I can't, then Sphinx is smarter than me. Um, and it might be sentient, we're currently uncertain. So. Uh, one of the cool things that comes with Sphinx, and this is actually part of the Python standard library uh, doc test, um, is that you can actually test your documentation. So the source code that I put in the triple brackets that represent a REPL that show up in my docs can actually be tested and checked to see if my docs actually produce the output that I say that they produce. This has actually caught bugs that unit tests did not capture <laughs> because we didn't have a proper unit test for it, but it broke the documentation and it caught it. This is one of my favorite tools of it, and it, it's, it's so amazing, runs super fast. Um, I highly recommend that if you are using Sphinx and you aren't already doing doc test, you should investigate using doc test. Um, and then Ron, you write your, <laughs> again, I, it just, I, like, I like man pages. You write your man page in Markdown, and you get a Markdown man page, and it's super simple. It's actually a Ruby gem, so don't, don't hiss at me for that, but um, it's a really cool tool. Article th Act 3, the final battle. Uh, my issue, I need to create many open source texts, uh, all with a similar format. This pro, uh, this is that is production ready out of box. I don't want uh, to worry about uh, building the text. They should just appear. Like I'm, I, I want I want a pipeline that just works for me. I want a workflow that jump starts uh, all the doc, all the writers whenever I want to write my docs. So my solution, 
was I create, I want something that allows for the author to generate docs, the author to write some docs, the author publishes docs, and the docs are host, published to a hosted solution. So the tools that I use to solve this problem are a cookie cutter, then I use a text editor just to automatically work on my docs, I get commit push relatively simply, and then we publish to GitHub pages. So the video that we have, it's creating a docs pipeline because never never do a live demo, they hurt. Um, so this was, this demo was done for PyTexas, so it's gonna have a lot of pytexas -y bits in it. Um, if you haven't gone to PyTexas, go. So we use a cookie cutter that you actually, everyone can um, use that I have on my on a GitHub for you. Um, so you create, you give it a site name, you give it a site description, and you say, hey, this is what I wanna do. I'm gonna give it the repository name, that way I know where I wanna put it in GitHub. Apparently I'm slow at typing. Uh, we give it a site author, username, so that way it knows where to go. Uh, you can select a license, whichever license you want to license your docs. You can select your documentation engine. Uh, we chose make docs for this one. GitHub pages, and we're going to go ahead and use Travis CI. So what did I get whenever I did all of this? Well, you have to CD into the directory before you can do that. So I get a license file. I now have a Docker file, a make file that I use for everything, read, my, read me and some docs. This is the make docs um, YAML file that is, used, that is was automatically generated, but you can easily use make docs new, new project. They have like, a, brand, like a, a project generator that generates this for you. So you could get, you won't get all of the extensions and stuff um, that comes with my cookie cutter because I spent like a week and a half learning all the extensions and making them work inside of this. So you get the name, you get to pick a theme really easily. I chose a material theme that I built. Um, the default theme is I think read the docs. So you can automatically build a read the docs formatted page. Um, do a nav bar, all of that jazz. It's really cool. And we go on from there. And then if you just look at the documentation that's inside of there, our quick index, we just have a simple markdown file that says Pytex is demo. And how do I use how do I use this locally? I can now run and test all of this locally because you should be able to test all the stuff that you want to do locally on your machine before it gets pushed out to public. So the first thing you have to do is you have to do a pippy and vlock because I do a lock file. Um, I've been bit too many times by transitive dependencies er, and we're not doing that anymore. And then I also speed up the build process and I bet everybody wishes their build process was as fast as my sped up one in my video. So you just do a make, make run, which basically just runs a make docs run or make docs serve. And now I have a web page that just sits here and does really cool things. Now I can just shut it down and then I can edit it really quickly. We run it again and then we refresh it. And now we have, it's really easy to use. Um, one of the things you can do is you can, if you use something like screen or tmux, you can just leave it running and then you can just update your docs as you're doing it. And every time you save it, it's gonna auto reload your documentation tool for you. For you. So we're gonna add some more text to this. Or apparently I, may, I changed my mind in the middle of what I was doing. Yeah, we add text. So basically we start it running again, we say woohoo. I forget that if you want a new line in Markdown, you have to make it actually do a break or two spaces at the end. So I'm gonna go back and fix that because it irritated me. And it fixed it. Um, so now we set up a GitHub repo and push. I'm not really gonna cover too much of that. Uh, you basically just set up a GitHub repo with the same name as what you set up in the markdown or in the project generation, and then we push it up to that repo. Uh, Travis will automatically detect that we have pushed this. And Travis is taking its time. Uh, and it goes ahead and does a build process, again, speeding it up for time's sake. So it does fail to deploy right now. We have a quick fail to deploy. If you're gonna use my, the cookie cutter that I'm going to provide, you have to set up a GitHub token so I intentionally put that there because I filmed this demo probably six times and kept making that mistake and realized that everybody was gonna make that mistake and I should probably just put it in the video. So go ahead and set up a GitHub token, um, which you would do through going through here and going to developer settings, cr create a new personal access token. For anybody with a quick camera, this token's already gone. Good luck. Um, ah, it's there, don't get it, yeah. I deleted this token like before I, before I edited the video. 
I used to work at a cybersecurity company, so um, tokens and stuff like that were was a big no-no to have it in a have it in a presentation like this. So then we restart the build, yada yada yada. Travis does the Travis things. It publishes, and we go over here. And now this is hosted on GitHub Pages. Uh, the URL is a little bit time to see, was a little bit small to see, but it actually is at my username.github.io, and then I can just go back to my uh, my repository, and I'm just going to add some text to show that this is a truly automated CI/CD process for releasing docs. Um, we do it again. We wait for Travis to pick up the build. Travis picks up the build. We go over here. We refresh it, and there we go. We've got an automatic, an autom fully automated docs process that we that you can get one. You can get from a cookie cutter that I have, and now that proves that we have a full process. A developer would just update the, the markdown inside of this process. They would upload it, and they'd never, they'd never see the rest of it. As long as you have everything set up, you're good. So can you try this yourself? Yeah. Um, I have a open source project that gets some love every now and then when I have free time. Not as much love as I'd like to give it, hopefully more soon, uh, based around building open educational resources, um, because I think the textbook racket is exactly that. It's a racket. Um, uh, so I built this, this cookie cutter so that way I wouldn't have to keep setting this up. Also. Has anybody ever gotten to a job and redone the last thing they did at the last three jobs and then they go home the next night and they're like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna open source this so I never have to do this again. Yeah, yeah, did that. That's why this happened. This was like the third time I had to remember how to set up this entire process and I was like, screw it, we're gonna do it. Uh, we're gonna make sure that we open source it. So this project, all projects are written in the make docs using uh, the default read the docs theme. Uh, uses a, a cookie cutter. If you're not familiar with cookie cutter, it's just a project generator kind of archetype. It's written in Python. It doesn't have to be used for Python things. It's pretty powerful. Um, as you can see, like even though MakeDocs is Python, I didn't set up a Python project with Cookie Cutter. I just templated out some stuff and set it up. Some sources, a really good book to go through about all of the stuff trying to do, treat your docs like code uh, comes from Ann Gentle's Docs Like Code book. It's actually kind of where the entire inspiration for this talk came from. Um, it's really good and I highly recommend it. It has a lot more concrete examples, including setting things up with like Jenkins, because I know a lot of people use Jenkins in their, pers or in, like, in their works, work environments or stuff. Um, so that's really good. If you are going to use Jenkins in MakeDocs, I do rec I do, you're gonna run into an issue with the shallow copy on the get, get checkout, because Jenkins checks out a shallow copy of head whenever it does a build, and MakeDocs actually pushes to a different branch on GitHub to make it work. So whenever you try to switch and change branches, you're gonna run into a problem with that. So if you do end up using Jenkins, you're gonna have to do a full git clone and, ch and, and then do a git fetch to get all the branches, not just getting the master branch. Um, ask me how many days I lost on that. So final thoughts. Every job that I've ever implemented this workflow at has uh, greatly improved the developer experience. Um, all of the docs now that are being used for cloud platform that are being disseminated across Expedia Group now are built with this exact same process. We're just not using Travis. Um, so. And it makes it really easy because not everybody has access to everybody's uh, wiki pages or everybody's hosting sites. But one thing most people have access to is everybody has access to GitHub. Um, because Ex Brand Expedia has been absorbing companies left and right, there's like eight of us that are trying to do this. And everybody, we only have the, the main access to a GitHub. So GitHub pages is a really good option. Um, or GitLab pages if you have GitLab. I don't know how the GitLab pages work, but I love GitLab. Um, it's like one of my favorite open source projects. Um, stop making docs a punishment. This is a, like, I don't, then what, I, what I say by this is not only don't make docs a punishment, don't make docs a separate story. Don't write implement code, test code, write docs. Those should be one story. Part of your job was writing when you write code is you should be testing your code and you should be documenting your code. They're not separate things. So it shouldn't be left to one person to pick up the docs load. Um, if your docs suck, people will abandon your project. This is, this is a no-brainer, especially if you're trying to build something in open source. You can have the greatest technology in the world, but if nobody can figure out how to use it, or if your tutorials are always wrong, we're like, we re live in a very readme-oriented development style now, where we, if I can't get through the readme and get your project to work, I'll move on to another project that can. Because there's very little of any projects that there's only one person solving that problem. I've, I see very few of that. I think I might be the only docs generated cookie cutter, but it's because I was like, what does nobody on earth need? And I found it. So, um, so yeah, you gotta be careful with that. So just don't have bad docs. Uh, versioning your docs is great. Uh, we should do a lot more of that, especially, um, I've been bit 
by that by using just you know having different versions of docs. I think I got bit with the security vulnerability using Nginx once. Um, my slides are already on my website. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I think that's all I have. Yeah. So we all take questions out in the hallway. Um, thank you very much. And I'm done. <laughs>